about four million years ago, our distant ancestors did something amazing. Something that changed them forever. It is the moment for many that we made the leap from ape to man. Imagine then, if somewhere very remote, there lived human beings who had never made this leap. People who have somehow remained hidden from the wider world. In early 2005, scientists made an extraordinary discovery. A family that shouldn't exist. The find was so unusual, it was decided to keep it secret. I was really fascinated, you know, here are humans doing things that they're not meant to be doing. But behind closed doors, the family has sparked a fierce debate. Some think they are the key to a breakthrough in human genetics. There is a piece of DNA, and within that piece of DNA, there has to be that mutation that actually causes the condition. Others believe they are striking proof of how we are shaped by the world around us. There's no way that a single genetic mutation by itself can turn the clock back four million years. I'm quite certain that there's something else in the background of this astonishing family that holds the key. But all agree that the discovery raises profound questions about what it is to be human. This is hugely important, or could be from the point of view of telling the evolutionary history of our species. June 2005, Professor Nick Humphrey gets a phone call from a colleague. John. Hi, John. So, how's the draft going? It's about an unpublished paper by Turkish scientists. The paper is about a family in a remote part of Turkey that has impaired hand skills. But there's something else about this family, something very odd indeed. This paper was about a family of quadrupeds, human beings who were walking like animals, and yet what the paper was ostensibly about was a rather trivial study in handedness, whether these, whether these kids were using their left hand or their right hand um, to do a pegboard task with. We couldn't believe that anyone would have thought that that was what you'd go for when you have such an astonishingly interesting phenomenon right there waiting to be studied. I mean, it's almost as if Moses was to walk into your office and you were to, as your first question, say, OK, Moses, which hand do you wipe your bottom with? Scientists have never seen anything like this before. This was potentially dynamite. The Turkish authors are from a top university. And they make an astonishing claim. They think the children are genetic throwbacks. That right here, right now, in the 21st century, there exists a family who are like primitive humans. A kind of living, breathing, missing link. It sounds far-fetched, but occasionally ancient genes do resurface, giving us a glimpse into our distant past. Excess hair and monkey-like tails are extremely rare, but extra nipples are very common. They're found along what's called the milk line that runs between armpit and groin, as it does in dogs. But this is the first time we've ever seen modern human beings reverting to what looks like an ancestral human gait. When something so extraordinary comes across your doorstep, you don't think, let's study it next month or next year. No, you want to go tomorrow. Okay, I'll give you a call tonight. It sounds like the anthropological find of the century. The kind of once-in-a-lifetime discovery that scientists dream of. Irresistible to Nick and his colleague John Scoyles. But the big question is, are the Turkish scientists right? Nick flies to Turkey where he meets one of the scientists who studied the family, Professor Una Tan. Dr John Scoyles from the London School of Economics also joins the team. 
All three are interested in the family because of the light they could shed on human evolution. But that's a view destined to cause offence in Turkey. It's an Islamic country, fundamentally anti-evolution. Charles Darwin's theory about the origin of man is taught in schools, but deep down the belief is that man is God's special creation, separate and distinct from four-legged beasts. No one would want our ancestors to have walked around on all fours. It's the symbolism of it all uh, that's not really accepted. And when, we come to, when it comes to human evolution, it's not necessarily what happened that we accept, but almost we accept the stories that allow us to view ourselves in a positive light. Not just in Turkey, of course. But what if God just said, let it be? What if he created the world with apparent age by the word of his power and said, let there be an Adam and let there be an Eve? In America, too, the battle over evolution still rages, as it has done ever since the Scopes trial of the 1930s put Darwin's theory on trial. Now, Howard, how does man come out of this slimy mess of bugs and serpents, according to your uh, professor? Well, man are sort of evoluted from the old world monkeys. Did you hear that, my friend? Old world monkeys. Going to the case. You and I aren't even descended from good American monkeys. Today, evolution remains under attack. Whatever the scientific evidence, people choose to believe in a divine creator, that we descend from Adam and Eve, not King Kong. Grandpa, welcome to Hillsborough, sir. Have you come to testify for the prosecution or the defense? Creationists simply dismiss fossil evidence of early man, which even top paleoanthropologists submit can be hard to interpret. Truth is, you can't make massive decisions with these little bones, and you can't, from a little fragment, tell the whole behavior of the animal. But what if there was living proof of a four-footed human ancestor? This is a very exciting moment for us. Um, we're just entering this village in, um, in southern Turkey, near the border of Syria, where we've heard of this remarkable family, which we're told have, have got several children who walk on all fours, on their hands as well as their feet. And since they were children, they've never stood upright. Uh, we don't know quite what we're going to expect from whether we'll really see quadrupedal humans. I don't know. It's never been reported in scientific literature. <laughs> Rajit Ulash has fathered 19 children, a lot even by local standards in this remote like Kurdish own, village. It's wonderful. Twelve of them were born totally healthy, but seven weren't, six of whom survive. And the first hint of the problem soon appears from down the road. This is Gulin. At first sight, he looks drunk. But he isn't. There's something wrong with his balance. Still, he's on two feet, not four. But then, one by one, the other children appear. Howdy, Charlie. There are four young women and one young man. 
Hussein has walked like this for 28 years. No one knows for sure when our ancestors stood up, but there are clues. One of the most haunting is this trail of human-looking footsteps, unearthed in Tanzania. Whoever made them walked on two feet, and they are more than three million years old. Many people think they were left by an early ancestor of ours called Australopithecus. Here's the most famous example, Lucy, a fossil skeleton found in Ethiopia in 1974. Lucy didn't walk quite like us, but she was certainly upright. So the Turkish family is walking in a way we last walked at least four million years ago. It is uncomfortable and moving to witness the extent of this family's problems. It is very difficult for us to walk like this. We may have done something like it as babies, but for human adults it feels very unnatural. And it's so tough that the US Marines use it as an endurance exercise. How come they're like this? How do they cope? And is there anything that could be done to help them? My heart goes out to them. It's an amazing thing to see these people. They're so familiar, they're human like ourselves, and yet in many ways they're walking in a way which no humans, no adult humans, have walked for two, three million years. What's behind it? We don't know. We're going to have to tease away, pick away at this to find out what underlies this extraordinary phenomenon. Standing upright is what defines us as human beings and it sets us apart from all other primates. Scientists find it so fascinating they've done some very strange experiments over the years. This unfortunate rat had its front limbs and tail removed just to see how it coped as a biped. Quite well, actually. Occasionally, animals are born without four limbs. And they can do well, too. This is Faith the dog who brings traffic to a standstill in Oklahoma City. Our closest relative, the chimpanzee, is also an occasional biped, as are other apes. And other animals dabble in bipedality too sometimes rather spectacularly. But no one does it quite like we do. And that's because we have developed a breathtaking sense of balance. Man is exquisitely adapted for life on two feet. So why, for the first time in four million years, are human beings again walking on all fours? Hussein and his sisters do not move with the ease we do on two. But Hussein is still able to travel for kilometres like this. The skin on the heels of his hands is as thickened as it is on the heels of his feet. 
Nick Humphrey invites Turkish psychologist Daphne Aruoba to help him unravel the quadruped mystery. The first clue is that more than one child is affected, but not all of them. And the second is that the parents are very closely related. He is her mother's mother's brother's son. It looks like the problem could be a faulty gene passed on by the parents to some of their children. So the condition is probably at least partly genetic. When you find a whole group of children within the same family showing the same problem, at once you think genes. But what exactly is that faulty gene doing? Has it really caused the family to devolve, as Turkish scientist Una Tan believes? Or could they just have some kind of brain damage? Okay, this is Senem. And how old is she? 24. Okay, and this, and this is... is Hajar. Hajar, come here, you can the affected children are between 18 and 34 years old. <laughs> they all still live at home, cared for by their siblings and by their parents, both now in their 60s. Emosh. And how do we know how old Emosh is? I think she's just a little younger than okay. Senam, so she must be like early 20s. And this is? Hussein. Hussein. Okay. And this is? Safir. Safir. Yeah. Professor Tan's idea is that these people must be throwbacks. And you can see why he might think that. I mean, after all, look at them, they walk like animals. And our ancestors were animals. Professor Tan thinks they've also got problems with speech and with dexterity, which makes them, in a way, more like chimpanzees. You can see why he might think that these are living fossils. But is he right? Professor Tan and his neurologist wife, Malia, have examined the children. Basic neurological tests confirm there is something wrong with their brains. <laughs> Professor Tan, meanwhile, has checked their ability to do simple tasks. Hussein manages to do this hand skills test fairly well. But Sophia struggles to understand what she's being asked to do. The children, concludes Tan, are mentally retarded, have limited language skills, and very little manual dexterity. They are, he says, very like our pre-human ancestors. And he's already given the condition a name. He's called it Unatan syndrome. It's terribly easy to be led away on some kind of romantic notion of, of living fossils. I'm not going to make any bones about this. I think that Professor Tan's description of this family as a devolution, as an th evolutionary throwback, is not only scientifically irresponsible, but deeply insulting to this family. And there is some contradictory evidence. Sophia couldn't or wouldn't do Professor Tan's pegboard test, but she can tie a scarf around her head with some ease. There isn't much wrong with Senem's hand skills either. Tan also claims they have their own unintelligible language. Their speech is a little slurred, but it's definitely Kurdish. And after Tan's gone, they begin to open up. Muhtar! Te. Her gün mü gidiyorsun? Fena kate. Oğlanla ilgilenmedin, o da seninle konuşmadı. Okay. She said it's not that interesting. She said this is the first time you're giving him attention. That's why this is the first time he's speaking with you. Yeah. So I guess I was always interested in the girly stuff. In fact, the condition resembles fairly routine brain damage, except for one crucial factor. People with this kind of damage have never walked this way before. There is hostility towards the family in the village. The local children particularly taunt Hussein. A 
few years ago, the family was told their home was cursed, so they rebuilt the family house further up the hill. Last year, when they ran out of water, no one would help. He's very worried. What would they do um, when they die? You know, when there's no one around to take care of them. They are being beaten up by the kids of the village and they are not being accepted, you know, like into the social circle. So they're outcasts. They're they outcast. are, yeah. They are. The way the affected siblings move suggests that something has interfered with the way their brains have developed. The Turkish and English scientists take the family to a local private hospital to have a look inside their heads. It is a frightening experience for some of them. But such cutting-edge examinations will mean the experts can pin down why they've been born this way. And perhaps offer them some practical ways in which to cope with the condition. Nick returns to Cambridge where he asks an old friend to have a look at the children's MRI scans. Roger Keynes is a neuroscientist with a special interest in how brain disorders affect walking. Oh. This is Hussein's brain. OK, so we're looking at uh, the brain sideways on. Starting up here, the head looking forward this way, you can see the eye socket, the nose there. And as you come across to the other side, just going straight through a series of sections of the brain to the other side. You can see the brain stem, this stalk of the main brain here. And at the back of the brain stem is this piece of brain called the cerebellum, the little brain. There is something very striking which hits you immediately, you see it. It's very clear that in the middle of the cerebellum here, what's called the vermis, it's shrunk. Hussein has marked brain damage. Supposing we were to look at a normal brain, can, can we see one? Have you got one here to compare? Yes, I've got one right here. And it's on a bigger scale, but it, I think, makes the main point that here, in the midline of the brain, you can see the cerebellum normally sized. No uh, loss of tissue at all. Right, that? this is Hesa. And same view, same problem. You can see Absolutely. it. Very clearly. Do we have Safia's brain here too? Yes. That's this one here. Same again. Absolutely. Very Marble, striking. The cerebellum is a pretty ancient part of the brain. Fishes have a cerebellum. It helps them balance and stops them flopping over to one side when they're moving along. And you know we have a bigger cerebellum. Uh, in conjunction with our brain expansion, the forebrain expansion. Uh, but it has essentially the same kind of function. It, it helps us balance and walk upright and walk steadily and also coordinates our movements normally. What would you expect to find as a result of the cerebellar damage? I'd expect them to have their feet quite wide apart as they mm -hmm. tried to walk mm -hmm. and then to stagger in either direction as they actually walk. Exactly, in fact, as Gulin does. Hatcher, too, mostly walks upright in the same way. But what about the others, who can only walk on all fours? <laughs> Last year, Italian scientists reported on this young man. 
Doctors could hardly believe their eyes when they saw his brain scans. He has no cerebellum at all, and yet he can still walk. So the damage to the cerebellum is not likely to explain why these children never got up onto their, onto their back legs I think, and walked like No, I don't think it is on the face of it. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly it doesn't explain why they're quadrupedal. I yeah. mean, has that ever been seen before? Not to my knowledge, no. OK, so this is a normal human brain, and here is the cerebellum, one hemisphere on one side, one hemisphere on the other side. Cerebellum is a very complicated piece of brain. There are lots of genes that build it, and we're only scratching at the surface at the moment. But some of these genes that build the cerebellum are known now. And uh, this gene, as it undoubtedly is, this abnormal gene in this family, uh, I think will be identified sooner or later. And no doubt it will turn out to be a piece in the story of how the cerebellum is built. Whether it's more than that, whether it's a, a gene that helps you stand up, I think is likely to be a gross oversimplification. Can't it be an easy thing to adapt an ape-like skeleton to cope with whatever is required to become bipedal? Looking at this human skeleton, can you show us what had to happen? Yes, I mean, the most obvious thing was the relative change in the length of the legs compared with the arms. To get the full human stride going, the legs clearly become long. And they also the question we've had in mind all along is what else is odd beside the cerebellar damage? I mean, something else has contributed to it. Other children with cerebellar damage don't end up walking on four legs. So the children have damage to a part of the brain involved in balance. But no one else with that kind of brain damage has ever walked on all fours. Nick returns to Turkey to hunt for other reasons why the children never stood up. This is God's test on him. These children are God's testing him. And after he dies, God will make sure that he's and the children are being taken care of because they did their deeds in this world, in this life. It is still a simple way of life here, driven by the seasons, poverty, and a Muslim faith which teaches acceptance. Nick believes the answer to the scientific puzzle will turn out to lie here. Not in a gene, but in the very fabric of the family's life. But 3,000 miles and a world away in Berlin, German geneticists are working on the family's DNA. And Professor Stefan Mundlos thinks the answer lies here. 
in these test tubes containing the family's blood. Herein, he believes, lies a great scientific prize. The identification of a gene for bipedality, the very essence of what makes us human. I think this is very novel because it has never been described before that people are able to walk on their four. So usually I think uh, the opinion was that this is not really possible, and uh, let alone that it's genetic. Modern genetics has revealed something amazing, that our DNA holds great secrets about our distant past. We have still in us genes and functions from all our ancestors. Um, and these genetic research has shown that we have, for example, many genes that are completely conserved between the fly and humans. So you can even exchange them and you could still, they will still have the same function. The German team believes a mutation in the Turkish family has switched off a gene for upright walking, allowing a much more ancient gene to resurface. Evolution is progressive. You get layer upon layer of, of adaptations added on top of what was already there. And obviously, like in a building, you can pull away the superstructure and sometimes reveal the original foundations. That can happen. The Berlin team has already found a patch of DNA where the family's mutation lies. They also know it isn't any of the known mutations for the type of brain damage seen in the family. So it really could be something new. It could take many more months to find the actual gene, and then maybe years of research to figure out exactly what it does. But Stefan Mundlos believes he is onto something big. And that, I think, is the exciting part of it. We can, by describing this family, actually show that uh, humans can walk on their fours, and then this can actually be inherited as a genetic trait. And that is very novel and very unusual. The German team has already published its claim for a genetic breakthrough. Some say prematurely. It's difficult to resist. If you see even the possibility of making a breakthrough of that kind, perhaps you're going to let your better judgment go. Perhaps you're going to not be as cautious as you should and think, here at last is the glittering prize. It's true of all of us. We want to be in on the major discovery. The problem is that it could just be a new gene for cerebellar damage. After all, the German researchers confirmed that Gulin, Hello. who walks upright, has the same genetic mutation as Hussein and the others who walk on all fours. Many people also think it very unlikely that a single mutation could take away the ability to walk on two. It doesn't make sense in, in, because it implies that the development of being bipedal came about in a kind of quantum jump. I mean, something happened and we moved from being, from being on four legs to being on two legs. That's not the way uh, human evolution or evolution of animals in general occurs. You're not going to explain that by a single genetic mutation. It's strange, but, but it's there is dissent in Nick's own ranks. His colleague John Scoyles thinks there could be a make-or-break mutation. I think Stefan is half right. There is a gene, but I don't think it's a quadruped gene. I think it's a super-balanced gene. If you think about it, there's nothing wrong with their balance on all fours. Yet on two, they're like fish out of water. So I think it is the super balance ability that is missing in the Turkish family. It's been knocked out by the 40 gene, and all that's left is the crude balance of our early ancestors. But intellectual sparring between scientists is of no concern to the family. They are much more worried about increasing local tension caused by the scientists and our presence. <laughs> She's worried that you may be comparing and contrasting these individuals with other species on TV. That's what they're trying to stop. That's why they're here. Clearly people in this part of the world have a very different picture of the origin of human beings. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what it is? I understand that it has a lot to do with how Islam um, believes we all came from Adam and Eve and if somebody proves or if a science is claiming that we um, evolved from apes then that puts the whole Islamic belief about the origin of people um, 
to a jib, to what you call, to something, to... I mean, it, it opposes that kind of thinking. So that's why people are very sensitive in Turkey um, because of Islam, because of the Muslim belief. The military police arrive and threaten to use force if we don't leave immediately. <laughs> the fear is that we are portraying Turks as animals. Insulting Turks or Turkey is a criminal offence here. It takes all of Daphne's powers of persuasion and the promise that we are leaving soon before we are allowed to stay. Of course, we weren't going to say these are monkey children. I mean, that would be totally unscientific and, and in fact, it wouldn't even make sense. But the deeper problem, I think, for the local community is that by even suggesting that we're descended from animals, we're flying in the face of everything they've learned from their culture and particularly their religion. Thank you, it's a great honor to meet with you. How are you? I'm very well. It takes Nick two days of persuasion to convince the village Iman to talk to him. Off camera, the Iman says he is nervous that being linked to a project exploring anything to do with evolution could invoke Al Qaeda retribution. He understands about Darwin, but he completely rejects it as an explanation or as a theory of how human beings are as they are. Darwinism just seems to be going against the word of God um, and therefore something which they're not prepared to tolerate. The same is true in many other countries too, particularly in parts of America, where thousands flock to creationist churches teaching a very literal